Metal Gear Solid is known for many things. It's brilliant, complex story, fantastic voice acting and soundtrack, state-of-the-art graphics, at least for the time, and innovative gameplay, among other things. Near the top of that list, though, are its boss battles. From expert marksmen to teleporting ninjas to giant walking battle tanks, its eclectic motley crew of foes has offered us some of the best and most iconic boss fights in gaming history. The Metal Gear boss has been one of the hallmarks and strongest assets of the series right up until recent history, a tradition which dates back to the very first game, Metal Gear, released in 1987. However, it wasn't until this game, released on the PS1 in 1998, that the series really became synonymous with boss battles. Previous games had them sure, but it wasn't until the move to the PlayStation which allowed for 3D graphics, voice acting and real music, and far more intricate gameplay mechanics that the hardware caught up with the series creator Hideo Kojima's vision and ambition. When we analyse the Metal Gear Solid games strictly to the lens of the boss battle, two games immediately come to mind as being the best. Metal Gear Solid 3 and this, the first Metal Gear Solid. And while it is arguable that MGS3 had the best boss battles from a purely mechanical aspect, if you were to look at them from all angles, encompassing story, character, iconicness, as well as how they simply play, I would wager that MGS1 has the most well-rounded cast of characters and encounters. Led by Liquid Snake, most of the enemies you'll fight in these boss battles are members of Foxhound, a once reputable US elite black ops unit turned rogue. A huge part of the game's story is based around their infiltration of an Alaskan nuclear facility and them holding prominent US military personnel hostage, already making them a group of interest to the player. There are 11 boss battles in the game, if you count all separate encounters with all antagonists, and a number of mini-bosses. For this list, I'm going to be picking the 10 best bosses in the game and ranking them from worst to best. When considering the order, I'm going to be taking elements like build-up, atmosphere and resolution into account. However, the most important facet of the bosses that will be considered when ranking the fights is the gameplay, or in other words, the actual fight itself. For this list, I won't be including any of the mini bosses, so as much as I really enjoy Snake's encounter with the genome soldiers while making his way up the spiral staircase, it won't feature on this list. Also, there will be spoilers. Nothing earth shattering, but twists, deaths and strategies will be discussed. So if for some reason you've never played this game before, I suggest not watching this video and finding a way to play it, as it truly is a classic. Also, if you like this video, check out my Metal Gear Solid retrospective review for a more in-depth analysis of the entire game. With that said, sit back, relax, and let's count down the Metal Gear Solid boss battles from worst to best. Sorta honorable mention, Snake and Liquid's Tunnel Jeep Chase. I had to leave one encounter off this list, and given the fact that this is essentially the third fight in a row with Liquid, it pretty much lacks the impact of the previous two, and feels like less of a boss fight than any of the other 10 we're going to discuss. Number 10. The Tank Battle with Raven and the Genome Soldiers. In my Metal Gear Solid review, I mentioned how the game for the most part made ingenious use of the original PlayStation's hardware cleverly utilising a relatively primitive set of tools in creating something which, for the very most part, is still very playable today. There were some moments, however, where the PlayStation's limitations were exposed. This boss battle is one of the primary examples of this. Running around a tank lobbing grenades at a man inexplicably perched above the hatch is just illogical for both Snake and Raven's henchmen, and reeks of Kojima and his team attempting to execute a poorly conceived idea for the sake of it. It's not awful, it's just mediocre, uninspired, and, once again, badly executed. Number 9. Sniper Wolf in the Underground Passage Another, albeit rare, example of Kojima failing to navigate the PS1's limitations here. Even though Metal Gear Solid's main draw was its cinematic story and presentation, its third-person shooting gameplay was also very well executed. The gunplay, while not refined, is fun, exciting, and once again, cleverly made the most of the fixed camera third person perspective template it had to work with. The first person moments in the game could feel weaker by comparison. And while the Nikita and Stinger missiles, more on them later, were fun to use, again I'll explain why later, the sniper rifle was extremely cumbersome, 
and by far the weakest weapon in the game from a mechanical standpoint. You couldn't move while you used it. You couldn't snap in and out of the sniper's view without holstering the weapon altogether, and you had to use it prone, meaning you were stuck in the same place with a limited viewpoint. And while this will be somewhat rectified in a later encounter, the fact that this first fight with Wolf takes place in a narrow corridor means that these handicaps are magnified. As a gamer, we crave challenges in our bosses. We want them to be more powerful and have more physical and environmental advantages than us. That makes it challenging and gives us something to overcome. However, the fact that we are rooted to one place in a claustrophobic tube means that you are unable to utilize any strategy which means you just have to keep popping rations to stay alive and hope for the best. Add to this the fact that Wolf can move around, shoot her rifle from prone, kneeling and standing, and the fact that every time she hits you it inexplicably rotates you 90 degrees, meaning you have to reset all over again, and the fact that you have to keep popping diazepam to stop your hand shaking, makes this encounter more of an ordeal than a challenge. Number 8. Liquid Snake atop Metal Gear Rex if this list was based solely on cinematic presentation, narrative significance and atmosphere, then the order would look very different. And while story elements like this arguably play more significance in this game as a whole, when ranking each boss in a vacuum, gameplay takes precedence above all else. With that in mind, this fistfight on top of Metal Gear Rex lands squarely in the okay but not great category. The hand-to-hand -hand combat in Metal Gear Solid was good for what it was. A quick, stealthy way of knocking out, choking out, or disposing of enemy guards. Quick, simple encounters that made you feel like a badass while simultaneously allowing you to execute a sigh of relief upon avoiding capture. However, when Snake's melee attacks become the focal point of a boss fight, it highlights how limited his moveset really is. As I've said already in this video and countless times in my review, one of the best things about Metal Gear Solid was how Konami managed to veil the game's limitations and highlight its innovative strengths. And the limitations of Snake's kickboxing was hidden right up until this moment. Armed with only a jab, cross, roundhouse combination, Snake has no choice but to fire the same combo over and over to defeat Liquid. What's more, just like with Wolf, Liquid has more dynamic arsenal of strikes in which to attack Snake with, which could potentially lead the player to think, why wasn't Snake able to use these attacks? I mean, they are fecking clones of each other. The tension of the encounter definitely elevates it slightly, but aside from that, it's a very one-dimensional boss fight. Number 7. Revolver Ocelot Okay, now we're getting somewhere. The first proper boss you come across, the game does a great job of building up the tension in the lead-up to the fight through its use of music, heavy atmosphere, and mysterious plot. Metal Gear Solid is known for its cutscenes, and the ones before and after the Ocelot Showdown are two of the best and most iconic in the franchise. The first sees Snake enter a dark room with the president of arms tech Kenneth Baker, a man Snake was sent to rescue, strapped to a pillar surrounded by C4. Ocelot appears to inform Snake of the president's predicament, brag about his revolver, no literally his gun, and then challenge him to a duel. What follows next shouldn't work but does. Snake chases Ocelot around the four corners of the room surrounding the still moaning Baker, shooting at his antagonist. Ocelot, in spite of being much older, is a step quicker than Snake, and thus is difficult to catch by simply chasing him in one direction. What's more, the bullets from his revolver ricochet off the walls of the room, meaning he can hit Snake without aiming directly at him. In spite of this, however, Snake does have options. One thing he can do is change his running direction in an attempt to confuse Ocelot and cut him off. Ocelot must also reload his gun after every six shots fired, giving Snake a chance to chase and fire upon Ocelot without fear of retaliation or, if he's lucky, he can even catch Ocelot standing still. The next cutscene sees the emergence of the mysterious cyborg ninja, more on whom later, who cuts off Ocelot's hand, prompting him to flee. The ninja confronts Snake who asks for his name. The ninja politely tells him he has no name before losing his mind, fleeing the scene and leaving the gamer with more questions than answers and a thirst for said answers. This, like some of the other bosses, is most fondly remembered for the bells and whistles which surround it. 
the introduction of new characters, the cinematic cutscenes, the dialogue, atmosphere, etc. But it is actually quite a fun duel. Not a gripping classic by any means, but enjoyable nonetheless. Number 6. Metal Gear Rex By far the most epic battle on this list, and the first really good one. What's so impressive about the showdown with Rex is how such an ambitious concept was executed so well on a 5th generation console. Considering how flawed a battle with a tank and a simple one on one sniper fight had been previously, the fact that a battle with a giant walking bipedal tank that fires rockets and shoots laser beams is as much fun and fluid as it is, is a testament to how much Kojima and his team nailed the original Metal Gear in execution when they were focused and had quality ideas to work with. The tank is of course driven by liquid. His plans of attack, as I've mentioned, are dynamic. He fires rockets at you, shoots you with a railgun, tries to fry you with a laser beam and can even stomp on you. The power, durability and variety of his arsenal means that Snake is overpowered and must strategize to defeat him. The hallmark of any truly formidable boss. Metal Gear's weaknesses is its radar and its T-Rex like mouth when open. This means Snake must time stinger missile shots to both while dodging the high powered ammunition coming at him. One of the things that knocks the Rex battle down a peg is its lack of finality. Sure, you blow it up, but you have to fight Liquid again not once, but twice. Meaning his and Snake's rivalry doesn't really get fully resolved here. Even still, the epicness of the encounter, the surprisingly smooth combat, and an appearance from an old friend, make this a really great showdown to play through. Number 5. Sniper Wolf in the Snowfield Right after their first encounter, it was plainly obvious that Snake and Sniper Wolf would meet again. What may not have been so obvious was the gulf and class that would exist between the latter fight and the former. As I've already said, the first sniper duel between Snake and Wolf was cumbersome and uninspired. However, something else that it lacked was any major build-up. Sure, she shot Meryl and made Snake backtrack to get a sniper of his own, but at this point we weren't really familiar with her character. A couple of codec conversations later, and Wolf reveals herself to be one of the best and most memorable characters in a game filled with wonderful ones. Her voice, demeanour, motivations, loyalty to Foxhound, her lethal attraction to Snake, her hold on Otacon. She's intelligent, vicious, sexual and complex, and by the time we finally meet her again, we're more than ready to throw down with her once again. This is yet another sniper battle with Wolf which means mechanically it essentially plays the same. So why have I ranked it so much higher? The reason, aside from the increased emotional investment in our character and story, is environment. In the first fight you are crammed into a tight hallway with very little room to manoeuvre, shooting up at a target from a force prone position. In this fight you have an entire snowfield to manoeuvre through. This not only gives you the option of lateral movement, but offers you excessive amounts of it, as well as snowy mounds to use for cover while aiming down the sights. This not only makes the encounter feel more balanced against an equally mobile wolf who can still fire from tree height positions, but eliminates the frustration present in the first fight while adding an element of strategy that the fight was lacking. You can technically cheat the fight using other weapons, but I'd advise against this, at least the first time around, so you can experience the battle as it was intended. The conclusion of the fight also has the best post-boss cutscene in the whole game. Satisfying, emotional and offering closure, it reveals a lot not only about Wolf's character and background, but Otacons and Snakes too. Number 4. The Hind D Battle The most underrated encounter in the entire game, Snake's showdown with Liquid Snake in a Hind D helicopter is often forgot about when discussing the great boss fights in Metal Gear Solid. Maybe it's because the pomp and circumstances that surround it aren't quite as iconic as some of the other encounters, or maybe it's because Snake has a more significant fight with Liquid at the end of the game. But regardless of why, there is no doubt that this is one of the most fun and most tense battles in Metal Gear Solid. One of the things I love about this fight is the build-up. After making your way to the top of a roof, Liquid will attempt to shoot you on sight while flying in it. This sets up a really fun abseiling demi-boss where you have to repel from the rooftop to a connecting bridge below. Fun fact, this abseiling mechanic is never used again in the game. 
From there, you have to pick off a group of soldiers waiting for you at the other end of the bridge. Then you have to run across it and into the parallel building while still dodging the Heinz fire. Make your way to the top of the roof of the other building, have a heart to heart with Otacon, and then fight the Harrier. As I said, the actual boss itself is a tense and fun affair. Armed with a stinger, Snake must fire it at the hind in an attempt to shoot it down. Liquid doesn't make it easy for you though, as he can circle the entire parameter of the small rooftop, which can expose the relatively minimal cover Snake can take advantage of. He can fly underneath the rooftop when he takes too much damage, whooshing back up to hit Snake with a hail of copter fire. He can also fly away into the distance, swooping back in at breakneck speed to drop missiles on Snake, which is one of the most lethal and difficult to avoid attacks in his arsenal. When you finally shoot the hind D out of the sky, it falls into the abyss below in a ball of fire, with Snake nonchalantly quipping, see you in hell liquid, as he walks away. Not quite yet Snake, but this is by far the most action movie moment in a game largely inspired by the genre. Number 3. Vulcan Raven now we're into the top three and oh boy are all of them real treats to play through. Just looking at these three encounters serves as a personal reminder of how frequently and consistently Snake has to engage in amazing boss fights throughout the game. All of these three fights have the same tangible qualities in common. They've got a strong build up, a satisfying resolution, they offer a unique challenge which evolves and morphs as the fight progresses and are, most importantly, all extremely fun to play through. Much in the same way that the second Sniper Wolf duel vastly improved upon and made up for the first, so too does this encounter with Raven trump your first meeting with him and his soldier minions. However, unlike the wolf fight, this showdown does away entirely with the original template of running and lobbing grenades, replacing it with something much more engaging, intense, creative, fun and akin to a straight up fight. Taking place in a large freezer filled with cargo containers, Raven has a chat with Snake beforehand, detailing his own personal history while also delving into Snake's soul, giving his fellow warrior an in-depth analysis of his psyche. Armed with an excessively large Vulcan cannon, Raven weaves in and out of the containers in an attempt to hunt Snake down. Possessing an abnormally large cone of vision to go with his abnormally large gun, it becomes immediately apparent after absorbing a few bullets that you cannot take Raven on in a straight up gunfight. Therefore, you must get creative. You can plant Claymore mines or C4 in an attempt to anticipate his movement. You can fire an Akita and hope he doesn't intercept it. Or you can, as I and many others did, strategically hide around the corner of the containers and pepper him with Stinger missiles. Take away enough of his health and Raven will go into a rage. He begins to move twice as fast as he normally can, and his movement patterns become more erratic and unpredictable. He'll also have fired at many of the containers as the fight progressed, which subsequently will have fallen, blocking certain pathways and in turn giving Snake fewer escape options should he find himself cornered. This is exactly the kind of progressive challenge and evolution that makes the best bosses in the series so tense, engaging and fun. When it's over, Raven turns out to be one of Snake's more ingratiating foes. Taking his loss like a man, he opens up the door leading to Metal Gear for Snake and insists that he must do battle with his brother. He also tells Snake that he and Liquid have a savagery within them that is more debased even than his own, before telling Snake that he will be watching him from the afterlife, as his patron ravens peck at his bleeding, dying body, returning him to the earth from which he came. Number 2. Cyborg Ninja Out of all the bosses on this list, the Cyborg Ninja is the one with whom Snake has the deepest connection and most history with. Sure, Liquid is his brother, but Snake doesn't find that out until much later in the game. And sure, Sniper Wolf shot Meryl, but protecting the Colonel's niece is priority number one for Snake, with Wolf merely being the cause of his ire and an obstacle in his way. The Ninja and Snake have history though, even though we don't realize it until halfway through the game. As previously mentioned, the Cyborg Ninja appears at the end of the Ocelot fight to relieve him of one of his hands. When Snake asks him to identify himself, he simply states, I'm like you, I have no name. When he has a meltdown and disappears, we know as players that we'll face him at some point later in the journey, a prediction echoed by Snake himself. 
What we don't know at this time is that the ninja is Grey Fox, a former friend turned enemy that Snake fought in a minefield in Zanzibar land during the events of Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake. It's good that we are unaware of this in the beginning though, as part of the intrigue of the ninja is his anonymity. When we reach the office where we find both the ninja and Otacon, we're greeted with a hallway full of bodies, with one dying man proclaiming that he and his colleagues were killed by a ghost. Upon encountering the cyborg ninja, he informs Snake that he wants to battle him to the death, a wish Snake is more than happy to grant. When you first engage with him, your first instinct will probably be to shoot at him or attack him with weapons, as is the case in almost every other Metal Gear boss ever. This proves to be an ineffective strategy however, as the ninja will dodge your attacks or deflect your bullets with his sword. Eventually, you'll simply attempt to strike him, which will land and hurt him. Throw enough strikes at him and he will sheathe his sword, and compliment Snake on using his fists as noble, proclaiming it as the basis of all combat. What's amazing about this battle is how it effectively masks Snake's limited striking arsenal. In the liquid fight, the fisticuffs could become monotonous simply because it was a straight up hand to hand fight, meaning that throwing the same left right roundhouse combo became boring as it wore on. Here though, it feels different somehow. The reason for this has everything to do with what the ninja is doing as opposed to what Snake can do. The ninja will teleport to avoid strikes while throwing his own strikes which are significantly more powerful than Snake's, annihilating his health bar with every blow. This puts all the emphasis for the player on defense and trying to intercept the man's movements. The other thing that the ninja fight does, which every other great boss in the game does, is evolve as it progresses. Two thirds of the way in and the ninja will double up on his teleportation and add a straight right punch so strong, it has the ability to kill Snake upon landing. He'll also implement stealth camouflage, teleporting to random places in the room and leaving Snake to find him. For the final stretch, the ninja will have another psychotic episode, which causes a pulsing electronic force field to form around him. Snake must run in and strike while the force field retracts in order to do damage, as his health bar goes down and the force field's pulses increase in speed. After the battle, the ninja reveals himself to be Grey Fox which, naturally, has a profound effect on Snake, and although the big reveal is satisfying by itself, his further descent into madness and his once again disappearing lets us know that we will see him again before the game is over. But even still, in that moment, holy crap what a fight. Number 1. Psycho Mantis The most iconic encounter in the entire game, and the one the majority of people point to when discussing Metal Gear Solid's boss battles, Snake's showdown with Psycho Mantis is the most ingenious and intense in the entire game. As I've said, the best bosses in Metal Gear have three things in common, build up, resolution and engaging gameplay. This has all of the above, but adds an unparalleled level of creativity not only unmatched in this game, but arguably by any other boss in the series. From the moment Snake enters basement 1 of the nuclear warhead storage facility, we hear an ominous organ melody, completely different from the rest of the ambient neo-electronic soundtrack which permeates the rest of the game. This indicates Mantis's presence even before we're formally introduced to him. And this is part of what I love about Mantis. He hijacks the game even before we first encounter him. But this is only the beginning of Mantis's stranglehold on the game and the player. After meeting up with Meryl, she and Snake make their way to the commander's control room where they come across Mantis. Right from the get go, Mantis uses his psycho telekinetic abilities, aided by his mind control music which we've been hearing now for minutes, to control Meryl and have her train her gun on Snake. This forces Snake to knock her unconscious. All of this takes place before Snake and Mantis even exchange words, emphasizing the fact that Mantis really is in total control of Snake and his environment. When they talk, Mantis proves his psychic powers by analyzing how the player has navigated the game thus far, i.e. recklessly or cautiously, reading the player's memory card assuming that they have other Konami games saved on it, and causing the controller to vibrate using quote, the power of his mind. All of this is pretty straightforward logistically, but utilized in the context of a boss fight, especially in a game from the late 90s, 
It was absolutely genius and was unlike anything ever seen in gaming up until that point. This was the moment that really solidified Kojima and his team as the fourth wall breaking creative masterminds they would go on to be heralded as for the next decade preceding Metal Gear Solid's release. The boss fight itself is similar to the ninja fight in that it subverts the player's typical pattern of attack. However, instead of holstering your gun to beat Mantis, you have to switch the controller port from player 1 to player 2. This, in Metal Gear World, disturbs Mantis' ability to read your mind and therefore makes him easier to attack. It's hard to explain for anyone who's never played this game how, one, groundbreaking this was at the time and, two, how much sense it made in the crazy world of Metal Gear Solid. As for the actual action, Mantis uses his mind to launch the room's items at you as flying projectiles. Things like large paintings, vases and chairs. He also varies his attack patterns also, making dodging them less predictable and more challenging. He also floats around from one end of the room to the other, meaning that the player has to adjust to shooting at a floating target rather than one on foot. The ways in which Mantis makes the battle more challenging are also creative and unique. He turns the screen blank, making the player believe for a moment that their television cut out, before restoring Snake's vision back, disorientating both him and the player. As you weaken him, he'll also revive Meryl, this time making her point the gun at herself, forcing Snake to attack her again, diverting his attention away from Mantis and onto her. When you beat him, you engage in one of the best post-boss conversations in the whole game. While it isn't as emotional as the one with Sniper Wolf, it's absolutely unapologetically raw. Removing Mantis's mask to reveal a hideously scarred face, Mantis explains his tumultuous upbringing and his desire to kill as many people as possible. What's amazing is that, through his raw honesty, Mantis actually becomes something of a sympathetic character in spite of his reprehensible actions. Towards the end, he even shows a moment of kindness and helpfulness before he passes on. When he does and the cutscene ends, you hope and pray that the other bosses in the game will be as good as this one. And while some will come close, none will ever quite reach the high of Snake's epic showdown with Psychomantis. <laughs>